Hey guys, it's Michael here. I'm just going to make an update for today. As you can see, there is this big sheep it's laying down on two boxes, the third box over there. And it's no longer up against the wall, so the light switch is more accessible now. We can turn on and off the lights. It is a huge chunk of material, and as I said, I can turn off the lights. Now it's not covered by a 1.8 by 3.6 meter sheet. That's 100 kilos in weight and dimensions. Um, at this point, as you can see, I'm marking it up. And what I've done is I've used a big piece of um, tube to help me draw up the lines because they're square. Uh, these edges aren't perfectly necessarily square. They might be out by five mil from one end to the other end of the sheet. And we can allow for some uh, tolerance because we can work that out later. Or um, before it gets cut, that's when they will polish up and finalize the measurements we can also then wash off the um, you know the marker with uh, turpentine methylate spirits and some other chemicals always wear gloves that's what we should be doing and there's always gloves everywhere but my dad likes to clean them up and from in the trash because that's what I always pretty much did I always wore my gloves and I know I had gloves over here before because I watched him when he was just like, there's too much shit here, Michael. Why do you have to keep all these gloves? You know, I didn't get very far with my gearbox because I got sick. That's the sucky thing. I got sick and I just couldn't do it. And I was in bed and had issues. And when I finally got my diagnosis of what I had, uh, here you go. This is what I use, methylated spirits. My dad likes to burn it off and then it costs me money. Because he likes to do it in his little candle thingy that he cooks with. But it's not in direct contact with food. It's just uh, heats up a steel box and then smokes it. The smoke is and the heat inside the container. And the steam is what cooks the food that he cooks. But he hasn't used it for a while. so And he keeps asking me for methylated spritz. So it's not ever going back because it's needed for so many things. Like, oh my gosh. And when you put it away, then it's needed again. And... It just gets frustrating, but it should go back in the uh, cabinet up the top. The reason you go up the top is because any fumes that come out of it can go straight up and they're far away from any, you know, sparks flying or anything. And it makes it a little bit safer by having those chemicals up in the air, not down on the ground, which, as you can see, they're on the ground now, but no one's grinding or anything in the shed. So, yeah. So at the moment, you can see... I've been marking up, I've already got one fully marked up, one piece, and then I had this complicated one where it's like all these questions like how do I figure out the measurements for marking this stuff up? It comes down to about a matter of calculus, like this is one sheet, we know there's 15 mil on the edge here, we know then there's probably another 15 mil here and another 15 mil there, and then we know the length of the sheet here it has 15 and 15 there, then we know what dimensions of this piece is, and therefore we can reasonably say that it's probably going to be within a certain tolerance. It gives me 20 mil of play to get both the sheets that I'm going to cut here right. Because one is longer than the other and the other one will just come out so easily. And what I can also do to just be certain of this is check out what the longest piece of my material that's going to get cut out of that section is. Because I can't cut everything out of it. It's, the material has been organized in such a way that the layout is pretty much this for one sheet. Now this is actually displaying two different ones, but one's more optimized. So if I was to, you know, make it just a little bit easier for the community to read what I'm showing, this is this is the sheet we're messing with. Now it's really hard to tell because the sheet underneath is the same color as what it printed out in grayscale. You can sort of see it in the bottom corner that that's the sheet. 3.6 these pieces are fitting onto that 3.6 meter sheet and then at the very top there's about 700 mil which by eye you wouldn't even be able to tell but 700 mil is a lot on this sheet so there's about this much left of material scrap left over after optimizing everything so that's a lot of material so what can I do with that last 700 mil of material to be smart any off cuts I get, I have options with now. And I have some unfortunate options which I can't really do much with. That being 700 mil and 1.8. There's this scaffold shelving here that I've got. And the shelving is not 700, it's 
600. So if I cut no extra 100 off of it when I find I have the final off cut, I can then make a sheet out of it that goes into the shelf here, saving on material and not putting it away for you know later use and conserving what material I have left cut off. Um, I can also save it and preserve it just in case I make any stuff ups. 700 mil width is actually perfect for one more chance of getting some of these pieces right. Um, then we have, what is it, like the back pieces that are going to go in between the shelves. I'm not going to panic about them. I'm going to let that piece there be its off cut there and cut that out and then we do something with it. And I offset them a little bit from the sides because I wanted to allow some tolerance if we want to make the corners round. So put a, a bevel in the corner that you can just do the strip, the um, <clears throat> the strip in one piece on the front edge, and also it would make it a little bit structurally more sound because it doesn't have just that sharp corner. Which things tend to snap on the inside on a sharp corner when they're going to snap. Otherwise, this is pretty strong as it is. I won't have to worry about it snapping because we'll have a leg support most likely sitting back here, but I reckon it's going to end up being around here that the leg will actually be supporting the table because I'm trying to have an equilibrium. If I go too far forward, it's going to work perfectly for the whole desk. If I go too far back, then it just there's a bit of stress that the desk won't be able to cope with the twisting angle here, which is where the problem would be. The twist here. That's where you would have an issue. So having the offset somewhere in this region here would give it the best structural integrity for the best results economically speaking and least chance of having a lot of other issues um, if it was just open this thing would be warped and struggle to hold itself together fortunately because we're having that shelf at the back like that piece of wood that's going to support both shelves and give it that rigidity so it doesn't flex or warp um, it should be fairly strong and shouldn't have an issue. There is ways for me to make the you know whole structure a lot more sound and a bit more less um, costly in the sense of how much it weighs and make it a bit more you know lighter essentially while maintaining the structure. That sheet at the very back it does not need to be the full you know sheet size you can have for each shelf you need to do this though, you can have one sheet go across the top here and then screw it down from the top and that will stop the top from flexing but then you can also screw it from the side so you know one or two screws on the side that will help give it a bit more rigidity so it doesn't wobble wobble which is what we want to avoid the wobble wobble because it can it won't have that structural rigidity to avoid wobbling side to side um, because each leg will have so much load on it that there will only be three screws per shelf and that's not going to necessarily be sufficient if you don't want to wobble wobble. That's six screws that are going to have to take on 100 kilos of weight and that's just scary to think about without any interlocking sort of mechanisms to maintain structural integrity. So the interlocking mechanism is the sheet of wood that will get screwed in from the sides because we're upgrading this in a sense to make sure that it has rigidity across the whole length. This only supports the, the leg and that's why it can sit in the corner that the weight doesn't you know, put all the stress on those legs that snaps them. It also is adjustable so if the weight's too much and it needs a bit more rigidity you can raise it to offset any differences between there and there and spirit level it this way, spirit level that way, make sure it's all good. Although that's not going to work. I know it's not going to work because you could have offset flooring and nothing's going to be perfect. But a spirit level can help you get it about right. And ideally, it's not about measuring it this way or that way. You have to measure it this way because the count of months is going to be going up and down like so. Um, also, if you don't get it just right, the clamping mechanisms on the edge might like, most likely will want to slide off and have that force pushed against the side and then they'll just slide off. So you need a bit of, you know, down incline but not too down, because if you go down like this, you know, the forces are going to be like, bah, fall off that way. If you go that way, well, it wants to walk that way, but it can't really. So if you want, you have to figure out what type of, it's like camber, positive or negative. 
So your positive cam would be whatever pushes out. And I think we'd want negative, um, to be really honest, because that pulls it in. But then you have the secondary mechanism which could slide. So there's all these little tiny risks of things going right and wrong. So the way I'm marking up now, I've just marked this line anyway. They're never going to be 100% accurate, but I've tried. So what I do is I unclamp the clamps. So side, and I'm using. The, I'm only doing the hardest bits first because once they're done, it's literally those are the pieces that I got this big sheet for. That's why I got this sheet. Now I just am um, being careful with the load on my arm because I do feel that. that's a bit noisy. And what I do is I get this piece of bar. And I can slide it so long as it's not the sharp edges on the sheet. I was I ideally would pick it up. And then I find out where the sweet spot is over here. And I, I try to just line things up nicely before I clamp it if I can't find the ideal pivot point. If I have a pivot point which ideally I should mark it up there, then I can sort of safely say, yep, this is the pivot point. I can clamp one side, then figure it out from the other, and then I don't have to worry about much else. So I'm just making my little tiny calibrations and it does look about reasonable for what it is. Now I've got two options. One I can cheat and avoid you know clamping it down. Ideally you want to clamp it down but if you don't clamp it down nothing really is majorly wrong because it's never even perfectly accurate anyway but you have to make sure you don't move the sheet so if you put any pressure on there, it will cause issues. This is the greatest way to mark it up. And I'm just doing it freehand and free clamped, um, you know, unclamped, which is silly, but it's okay to some extent. You just never expect anything to come out perfectly. But it is ideally okay as it is. It's, it's crude, it's rough, anything could possibly go wrong with this um, way of marking up anyway. As you can see, I've still got one to mark up there and it's not really fully marked there. See there's a trail of black. And, you know, to, to be realistic, you get the tape measure and you measure every aspect. Because this looks wider than that end. I was to check this, it should be 450. This here is gonna cut out to 445, which isn't good. Which it does feel like this end is wider than that end. So if I check the other side, it should be also 445, unless it's an optical illusion. And something else is wrong. And this one here is. 333 so like I said it, it definitely was not the collusion and it's hard to get things perfect what I can do with this mistake in mind is if I know that that's correct over there I can then leave that line there move it over maybe a little bit and then draw straight down but I did have the intention to get some tape and throw it over top and do some stuff once I've marked this up, it's the idea of just making sure those measurements are correct. Making sure that we say what these lines are meant to be and how much they're meant to be is always a really good idea. In fact, I might actually do that. I have a white water-soluble marker in my pocket, but white on white doesn't work, so it's white on black. White on any other surface would be okay. So identifying all the details of this sheet what I can say, so I can go over here and I can try to figure out which one's which, and it all lines up to a piece of paper. Um, and then I can use the measurements to pretty much say this is what this sheet's size is. So this here is 1592, 1592. Um, the, not all the measurements are actually here, so that's really unfortunate. 1592. Um, 450 and we just go around and do all the measurements and just write them down that way it can be double checked when it's 
actually getting done. This is fourteen eighty nine, I think. Fourteen seventy four. Fourteen seventy four. I have to make sure to write down the right measurements because at least if I have all the common measurements done, then they can intersect to the same sort of point. And four fifty. So that's what I do. I write down the measurements, and then it can just be refined or rechecked later on when the cuts actually start getting done because that's what the measurement should be at the end of the day. So if we don't get them right, then we're in a bit of uh, strife. Any custom cuts have to be accounted for as well, but since I'm not actually gonna necessarily do a fit today, it's getting dark and I need to get ready for tomorrow and I'm not gonna have enough time to enjoy some stuff in my life. I'm gonna just hurry up, wrap this up and get on with my life, I guess. And I know that these are 350, and ideally I should be facing outwards. 350, because I know it's 100 less. I don't know, those measurements translate over to here. But which way? I haven't got a clue. Never have a clue. Uh, 1592, which is probably incorrect. Actually, it is 1592, isn't it? Or is it? It's 1592, that's right, because the, sh uh, the desk inside is, <sighs> the desk inside is 15, sorry, 1608, 92, and we're only minusing off each side 16 millimeters, so 16 from here and 16 from there, and not anymore, I don't have to go 32, because I'm not putting an extra piece of wood on the back end, to support it on the desk. And if I did, well, I don't think it's necessary, honestly, since I've got the leg in the corner and that's what we're gonna be using. So, last translation of, not 15, or only two, it's down the bottom of the page, 1474. That one's there. And then 350. So, that's pretty much done. And I feel like it's fair to explain something as well. So I'm going to start packing up. If anyone... Oh, God. I know! Go away! To explain the design decision to have a shelf be 350mm and another shelf be 450 why this one's wider and this one's narrower, is you've got to think about the desk and the design and what you want it to be capable of doing and what you don't want it to be capable of doing. So the 450 is literally the very top shelf. I want to be able to hold some large equipment that isn't too heavy and I want to be able to hold trays safely and not necessarily fall off. So it's a bit of a feature for the top to be a bit larger than normal and it allows me to put more stuff up there. But I have to be careful of how high my desk actually goes up and down. The reason that they're not consistently the same dimensions, why this one's 350 and that one is 450, is 350 is because every 100 mil, it's like pretty much that, there is this thing that can happen where when I build my desk, it essentially is going to do something where I'm gonna have to push my monitors forward more and be in front of the material that's overhanging because the monitors are literally that big, they won't fit. Okay. Now there's every chance that with my desk, I'll probably end up putting on a bigger TV or monitor or something. Now, I've got a big monitor. By design, it is gonna fit under this, these shelves, and you'd say, well, why don't you just up this by the 100 mil then? So the chance of me getting a bigger monitor means I'll end up creating useless space. So there's already a chance of this 350 mils being useless space. However, thankfully, after some measuring at home today, I checked, it will be okay. I've got some leniency. I just added on a few millimeters to 
the legs today because of some issues I found and it turns out that we'll be all right. So that's a good thing in the end. And my dad's making noise and being a smarty pants. It's my dad for you. Trying to brag and stuff and be annoying when he's uh, not sober. It is what it is. But by design, this is gonna translate onto my desk. Um, then from there, being that it translates onto my desk like I'm saying it's gonna do, I end up having, you know, all the space I need for everything. So as it was designed, if it did get cut and made, I would have had a real problem on my hands. So it's lucky I didn't do what I did until now. <clears throat> Oh, don't get in my face about it. So, with what's being said, essentially this monitor here, as it stands and sits, it won't fit. But if I go down, this is where it will fit. That height is within about 10 millimeters of not fitting. So if it was 10 millimeters less on the shelf, like if it dropped 10 millimeters, this wouldn't fit. This would be forced to sit forward. I did a check 350 mil. What would this look like is the question. You ask yourself, what would it look like? This monitor didn't actually fit. Now, it's so hard to set things up that you can actually see, but this will give you a bit of an idea. So this is where all my stuff is. I can push it back. Look how much room I actually have right this second. You can't barely see because they're so low and whatever. But if we go up here, look how much room there is here. I've got enough room for a sheet of paper to sit and draw and do whatever I want on this sheet of paper. So, now, what I'm going to do, show you what the, the test I did earlier. The test I did earlier was grab this, grab this, grab this, and drag it forwards to the point where it's pretty much not going to fit or it would allow me to fit. So this would be, that's, that's exactly where it would have to sit this monitor in order for it to fit on the desk. Now, that's with the shelf. The shelf isn't here, so as you can see, there is literally lost space right here because the hutch forces this monitor this specific monitor has to come forward because it will not clear here. This would be literally hitting the hutch at that point. It'd be cool to come up with a design where the hutch can be a bit more adjustable in a way as well. We can add some pieces to it that if someone was to buy it, you could just slide in a slot, boom, raise it. Slide in a different size slot, boom, raise it. So, all that space is now right here and it's wasted because you're never going to end up using that space for anything useful unless you use your window as like a display and you want to show off what's here but then that would throw off the point what the back of the lighting on this monitor is although i, I don't see this lighting anyway it's amazing lighting but it is what it is so that is exactly what happens if you design it wrong and like i said the 350 mil mark. I, I feel like we're still not quite there, but ideally, it's not about clearing the whole thing. It's only about clearing this. So it might be able to, it's within a, about, you know, that gap. It's how much more I could gain if, you know, this monitor does get used on the desk. I have no idea what will happen. And also, not to mention, if you're sitting this close to this freaking monitor, that, it's crazy. And imagine if you were even closer. Oh. This is useless now. It's useless because it's so close. And the idea is you get big monitors, you put them to the very back of your desk and then they're like almost like a normal size monitor. Okay, that's, that's pretty much the idea. So I'm designing this hutch based around the idea that everything can possibly fit and it Everything can't go wrong because I've gotten the biggest monitor that I intend to buy, which is 32 inch. I could go bigger, 
but there is no real point. And say I did get a TV, that's pretty close to where it's going to have to sit. I would actually be okay with a TV because most of the time it's a flat panel and the legs are built into here and then sit in a more ideal spot rather than this thing here and then you have an adjustment. It, that's TV is literally stationary and does not need you know, this pivot ability this way or even up and down or whatever. It just sits at the height you set it at and then does nothing. You have a remote, you turn it on, you turn it off. That's it. Because you're not sitting this close to TV. You're going to be in bed looking at the TV or on the couch looking at the TV. So ideally, I'm not necessarily looking to get a TV. I'm just saying that this desk will be capable of supporting a TV and then you still can get over the TV and reach in and put stuff in and then the TV sort of acts as a stop point that, oh, stuff can't fall off. But that's not the intention. That's, the idea is you put stuff properly on the shelf and that's it. You don't worry about the TV being in the way. So it's not, this was a really well designed desk. The unfortunate thing is cable management wise, it hasn't fully been fought out yet. And I don't have all the adapters I need. I don't have everything I need, but I gotta wait until this is finished because not everything's necessarily gonna be on the same level. I'm thinking of having some stuff literally up one shelf and I might even cut holes into the backboard and you know feed my cables through and stuff or even feed them straight up through the floor which I have some parts for that but that is what it is I'm getting sick of this monitor turning on and off on and off like this I think the graphics card has an issue on the laptop and that's why it's doing this the laptop doesn't seem to have an issue whatsoever with running and that's about it Oh my god, he keeps coming back and bothering me. Get your dinner! Bugger off! It's on the stove, it's hot. I already know. Oh my god. And I'm just trying to wrap this up. It's been going for too long anyway, so it might not even upload. But, we don't know, we won't know until we try. But, yes, I do all my measuring and stuff. Do it in Blender, take a screenshot. And then print, and that's about it. But yes, you can see that the, sh the shades of grey are different here, and you can identify the sheets. It was to have a differential between each of the sheets that you could actually see this one, and that one, and that one. <sighs> if only I made the sheet at the very back pure white, then made them different grayscale levels. But then there's a risk the tone won't work, or there's risks of anything going wrong. Yes, the monitor just turned off again. Getting sick of it. I think it's the graphics card and the laptop. Don't know. And it's not being stable today. So maybe you got to shut it down or update or something. There's something weird going on. But anyway, this is Michael. I'm signing off. I'm going to get on with my life. Today at least. Tomorrow's going to be busy. Take care.